Thank you everyone for attending. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Gordon Rutter and I organise the Edinburgh Fortean Society. We're currently meeting online. Uh, normally we would meet on the second Tuesday of every month in an Edinburgh pub and we would have a talk and a few drinks and a wee chat. And we're trying to recreate that experience as much as possible. So we're still um, having these talks when they're live, such as this one um, on the second Tuesday of the month at 7.30. And we when the talks are pre-recorded, we're releasing those talks at that time on YouTube. So if you haven't seen the YouTube talks, just do a quick search online for Edinburgh Fortune Society on YouTube, and that'll bring up uh, the whole range of talks which we've had going since April of last year. So we've got quite a quite a range of different things there, quite a quite a wide number of uh, interests that people can tap into as well. Once things are safe and back to normal, I don't think we're quite there yet. I'm not anticipating meeting in real life this year, but once things are safe and, and everything's okay, we're almost there. Um, we will start meeting again. And I'll look into how we can continue this part of the experience as well, because I am aware that there's a lot of people who've been accessing the talks who wouldn't be able to get to Edinburgh to attend in person. And it's absolutely brilliant that those people are attending. And I'd love to be able to, to have them uh, still able to attend in the future when we go back to real life talks. So I'll keep everyone posted on absolutely everything that's happening. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to have a presentation from Steve Parsons, who I'll introduce momentarily. And once he's finished, there will be an option for a Q&A as well. So if anyone has questions, please keep them till the end. Or if you, you want to, you can type them into the comments section at the moment. And obviously, when we come to the Q&A, we'll take questions from you directly if you want to speak, or we'll take them from the um, from the Q&A box, the comment box on uh, on Zoom there, so you can access them anywhere at all. So, ladies and gentlemen, tonight's speaker uh, is somebody I have known for for quite a few years. Um, I'm not sure either of us could probably say exactly when we first met. Um, and he is Steve Parsons, and Steve has been up to Edinburgh and given a talk to the Edinburgh Fortean Society in real life, face to face. Uh, so it's nice to welcome him back, even though it's uh, over the airwaves rather than in real life. Steve has said that he wants to do his own short introduction. So all I'll say is that there are a number of books that he's published, some of which he's going to be mentioning tonight. And I'll put links to how you can buy all of those in the comments on the YouTube section. And I'll also put links to all the ways you can interact with the Edinburgh Fortune Society as well. So ladies and gentlemen, talking tonight on ghost hunters and ghost gadgets, Steve Parsons. Thank you very much, Steve. Ah, thank you, Gordon. Yes, it's, um, it's been a number of years since um, you and I first met. And that's um, kind of how I should introduce myself. I mean, you know, who am I? What have I done? Why am I here speaking to you? And why have I written any books that you, you should even bother going out to buy? Um, well, um, Briefly, I began looking uh, my own search to see a ghost um, in excess of 50 years ago. Um, I, I, that's the bit I don't like saying because it reminds me of how old I am. But I was, I was about eight or nine, eight or nine years old, um, possibly a little younger. When my uh, parents are on holiday, um, I used to drag them. Um, and demand to go looking for ghosts and then um, apparently also whilst at primary school um was hosting seances in in the garden shed um the interest never waned um uh, it periodically got taken over by other things uh, my love of airplanes and the loch ness monster um being being amongst them um and gradually down the years um i realized uh, I, I was a member of several paranormal teams, local paranormal teams upon um, Merseyside, Cheshire, where, where I originate from, although now I'm in West Wales. And um, 
eventually it dawned on on me that I was never really going to see a ghost. Um, but my my search for answers never went um, remained undulled, and uh, it sort of gradually uh, occurred to me that the only way that I was ever going to find any answers at all to the questions I was posing myself was to use the methods of science that I was learning at school. Um, you know, the uh, the basic sciencey stuff that we all did at primary and secondary school. So we formed a group, myself and Dr. Anne Wince performed a group, which was called Parascience. Um, also joined the Society for Psychical Research and ASAP and um, read widely on the subject. And now, uh, 50 years plus later, I find myself a council member for the SPR who have commissioned two of the books that I've uh, written. Um, I'm also um, the, I suppose, one of the member, the, the lead investigator for the SPR's new um, field research group, which is a group of five investigators. Um, that's, in fact, it's the SPR's very first investigation group because previously the SPR have always relied upon the goodwill of its membership. And it's to the SPR I'm going to turn for well, once I start pressing the relevant buttons and start sharing the right screens. Um, it's always difficult to make sure you share the right screen when you've got so many open. I wouldn't like to share the screen that's open at the top at the moment. But there we are. You should all see um, my pet cats. And at the same time, I shall also kill off my camera. There you go. So you don't have to look at me for the rest of the evening. But I'm going to go with the SPR and I'm going to, I'm going to uh, refer to one of my heroes, um, the uh, Guy Lyon Playfair, a man who I was privileged to call a friend and who inspired me with his um, own search for answers. And this is an extract from his book, This House is Haunted, which is the the relating of the Enfield poltergeist. The night of Saturday, the 12th of November, was one of total bedlam, but with a difference. It was not caused by the poltergeist so much as by the investigators themselves. For my first attempt to bring in outside help from fellow members of the SPR backfired with almost disastrous results. I had invited a psychologist whom I will call Dr. Knott from, the, from a provincial university. Um, and I invited him to come along and bring whatever instruments he could try in order to get some recorded data to support our evidence. Dr. Knott had investigated poltergeist cases before and was regarded by some SPR members as an expert on them. I specially asked him to come along since Gross and I would be there and there was just no room for anybody else. However, to everybody's complete surprise, no less than six SPR members descended on the unsuspecting Harper family all at once, followed by two surprise visitors whom Dr. Knott and I both assumed each other must have invited. In no time, the house was like a railway station in the rush hour. Dr. Knott unpacked his bag and covered the family dining table with all sorts of small gadgets. Gross took me to, took me to one side. What's all, all that stuff for? He asked. Search me. You're the scientist, I answered. I was making better things than that in fourth form at school, he went on. Is he serious? Well, I assumed he was or I wouldn't have invited him. Although before too long, I began to wonder. Dr. Knott took his bits and pieces up to the bedroom and asked the girls to come with him. He had several small compasses, a gold leaf electroscope and a rudimentary infrared radiation detector the needle of which started wobbling like mad almost as soon as Janet and Rose went anywhere near it. Not was intrigued. Gross asked Janet to try and make it wobble again, which she did several times. 
However, Dr. Knott said later in his written report that these deviations were due to some unspecified instability in the contraption, which he told me later he had only made that earlier that week and which he had not had time to test at all. One of the visitors then tried some unorthodox research of his own. When the girls complained that the double bed, which they were both in, was shaking, he promptly jumped in with them, causing them both to get somewhat excited. Later, this same researcher put some balloons full of water beneath the bed as bait for the poltergeist. These were flung by persons and pol or poltergeists unknown in all directions, making a terrible mess as the water seeped through the floorboards into the living room below, drenching the, unfortunately, the unfortunate family budgerigar. I never did find out what this experiment or the equipment was designed to prove. These days, it seems almost everybody wants to be a ghost hunter. Currently, there are around 1,000 separate ghost hunting teams in the UK. Meanwhile, over in the USA, the numbers are higher, currently standing in excess of 3,000 groups. In December of 2018, the Daily Mail claimed that there were 12,000 professional paranormal investigators in the UK who stand ready to rid your home of its troublesome ghosts. But for those of us who are now too old to go night clubbing, ghost hunting has now become a cool way to spend your Saturday night with your mates battling against evil possessive demons, listening intensively to the disembodied voices of the dead instead of the incessant beats of the house DJ or watching through bleary eyes as the spirits flash the multicolored lights on your ghost detector. The desire to be a ghost hunter pervades every tier of society, from airline pilots and barristers, burger flippers and homemakers. In reality, no qualifications are needed or even exist for one to become a ghost hunter. But many of them share one thing in common, other than a desire to spend their nights in spooky houses. They all seem to share the belief that they are eminently qualified to hunt for ghosts, irrespective of their academic prowess and occupation. From university flippers, uh, professors to chicken pluckers and burger flippers, they demonstrate an unwavering belief in their own abilities, even if they lack any real experience. Phenomena, or I psychologists refer to this self-belief as the Dunning-Kruger effect. In addition to this powerful sense of self-ability, many investigators also share a passion for the latest item of cool ghost hunting tech in order to assist them in their quest. Although investigators, some investigators, also still rely upon those good old-fashioned methods which have always proved so gloriously unreliable in the past table tipping, dousing, and mediumship remain popular with the cash-strapped and the spiritually inclined. Paranormal investigators have always been an incredibly creative and inventive bunch, and down the years, many items have been pressed into service to aid the, the ghost hunters in their quest for answers. These include a range of purpose-designed meters and devices for measuring or observing the various emissions that emanate from the ghosts. And these days may also include an assortment of children's toys, often stuffed with a wondrous array of electronic devices that claim to indicate the presence of some playful interacting spirit. The investigators may source their tech ready-made off the shelf from a multitude of outlets, including many which have been established to serve the paranormal community. And if the store doesn't have it, then the more inventive or creative simply set about making their own ghost hunting equipment. One might imagine that the use of equipment for investigating claims of haunting is a comparatively recent phenomena. And that is partially true, as many of the early investigators relied upon their own wits and senses. 
Many were armed with nothing more than a notebook and pencil, although the occasional ghost hunter was known to carry a loaded pistol. Prior to any use in haunted houses, technology was used by psychical researchers who were interested in studying the claims relating to spiritualism. These included Professor Robert Hare, who in 1853 began testing claims of mediumship using a series of spiritoscope devices. These consisted of a circular disc with the letters of the alphabet around the perimeter. It was intended to measure the psychic forces which the medium applied in order to spell out the message. Hare was surprised to discover that the spiritoscope apparently worked. And on one occasion, his deceased father used the device and implored him to listen to reason. Unfortunately, despite the apparent success of the spirit world to communicate using the device, Hare was unable to discover anything at all about the nature of the forces that were, were employed to do so. Inspired by the work of Robert Hare, Professor William Crookes also set about conducting his own series of tests using a device which was similar to the spiritoscope. He used this device for a number of years throughout the 1870s in order to test a number of the leading mediums of the day. Although several times more sensitive than Hare's device, Crookes also completely failed to discover anything whatsoever regarding the nature of the forces which were seemingly applied by the psychics. The first documented plan to use equipment in a haunted house investigation took place during 1898, when a small group, including leading members of the Society for Psychical Research, investigated a Scottish shooting lodge, wherein several people had reported inexplicable sounds and apparitions. So frequently were these sounds reported that the group planned to try and capture these by using a phonograph. They also planned to utilize a seismometer in order to attempt to determine if the sounds had a rational or natural origin as the area was prone to frequent earth tremors. Unfortunately, a legal dispute with the owner of the property prevented the group from ever taking their equipment to the house. Fans of the movie Ghostbusters will imagine that the ghost goggles worn by the team in order to allow them to see the ghosts were simply an invention of the movie makers. However, Sir Isaac Newton had speculated earlier about the existence of spectra of light existing outside that of the visible. Later, the scientist Johann, Johann Wolfgang Goethe had success visualizing these hidden light spectra using prisms that were filled with colored dyes. Several pairs of special spectacles based upon Goethe's prisms were in fact commissioned by the Society for Psychical Research in 1903. They were most famously used with reported great success by the Hungarian psychical researcher Aral Stein during his third Asian expedition of 1913 to 1921. But mystery surrounds his follow-up expedition in 1922 when he claimed to make such terrifying discoveries that he completely abandoned his research and ordered that all of the records of the two expeditions should be destroyed. One single pair of the Goethe spectacles still survive and are held in a private collection, but they were undoubtedly the inspiration for the ecto goggles worn by the Ghostbusters. The name Harry Price is perhaps synonymous with ghost hunting. Price was an engineer and an inventor who dedicated himself to studying many psychical and mystical phenomena. In 1925, he created the National Laboratory for Psychical Research. He is perhaps most famous though for his investigations which lasted more than a decade, um, nearly 20 years in fact, um, of Borley Rectory 
uh, including um, placing a team and taking rental of the property for one year. Price put together his own small ghost hunting kit, which contains some of the basic items which he thought may be helpful, including felt slippers, whiskey, and a bowl of mercury. But he also included a number of more advanced pieces of equipment, including recording thermometers and infrared cameras. As technology and computer control improved, this led to the development of an advanced monitoring system that could be left unattended for long periods in order to search and measure any anomalies within a haunted location. The system was developed jointly by Tony Cornell and Dr. Alan Gould. But let's listen to Tony Cornell. He can explain it better than I can. Well, we've become uh, um, rather conscious of equipment. In the past, what people used to do is they go along with a notebook, um, pencil, uh, camera, tape recorder, um, and mainly common sense. That's a very uh, important piece of equipment, believe it or not. These days, what we've decided to do is to try and see if we can get uh, upmarket. And we produced a thing uh, called Spider. Uh, we had to call it something, it's a black box, it's an electronic box. And it has all these wires sticking out. And uh, Spider stands for Spontaneous Psychophysical Incident Data Electronic Recorder. Silly, isn't it? Uh, principally, equipment that will register changes in the physical state in the room because people say that physical things happen things are thrown they see ghosts that aren't there they, they light up and they disappear things are moved there are smells there are electrical problems there's interference so we take equipment to measure that and to record it so we can play it back and mainly common sense and mainly common sense more than ever before the modern ghost hunter is well endowed with a dazzling array of technology, some of it genuinely helpful, whilst the usefulness of other items is perhaps more questionable. Let's just take a quick peek at some of the items that have recently been employed by investigators searching for evidence that their prey exists. The first item is a miner's, a miner's lamp, which I extracted from the investigation team um, after the, they had been using it at a, uh, an investigation that took place in a Welsh mine, an underground Welsh mine. The uh, idea behind the experiment was that they would light the flame and seal the lamp. Now, miners' lamps are designed to be locked whilst underground so that the miners couldn't expose the, the naked flame to any explosive gases. Uh, they could only be taken up to the surface where an unlocking device was applied um, and then obviously the lamp could be extinguished. So they lit the lamp, they sealed, they closed the lamp up and they invited the spirits to extinguish the flame. And periodically throughout the investigation, a member of the team was sent off to check on the, on the flame. To their surprise, it was found to be extinguished. Well, to their surprise, to their excitement, it was found to be extinguished. They were ecstatic. The spirits had indeed seemingly extinguished the flame. There was plenty of um, fuel still in the lamp. There was no way the flame could be blown out. They demonstrated that by blowing at it and waving things at it. And then a gentleman stepped forward, a member of the public who was an el a fairly elderly gentleman stepped forward. Um, he'd been part of the public um, accessible ghost hunt. And he said that, well, it wasn't the spirits, it was me. He'd been a miner and the miners, of course, didn't want to waste time at the end of his shift um, ex going off to the lamp room to extinguish their lamps. Rather, they, they found a way of extinguishing the lamp um, as they came up in the um, lift. So they could just hand the lamp in and go straight to the showers and away. And he demonstrated the method, he, um, which was to give the lamp a very sharp wrap on its base, causing the flame to jump from the wick 
and and extinguish itself. Um, so unfortunately, and then he admitted he'd been demonstrating that to his wife. Oh, I remember how how we used to do this, and uh, of course he put the flame out. At least he owned up. The next one is a simple Morse code key. Um, again, <laughs> used uh, just before we went into lockdown on a public paranormal investigation by a paranormal team. Um, the device uh, the, was connected to a, a battery circuit and um, a buzzer uh, via the terminals. You can see the screw down terminals. Um, it was then placed under a glass bell jar and the spirits were invited to communicate by means of Morse code. Um, then somebody asked, well, how do we know if they're communicating? Does anybody here know Morse code? Well, it's written on the, on the, of course, you can see it on the Bakelite uh, base, but no, nobody in the investigation team actually understood or could read uh, Morse code. It was a bit of a failed one. Um, this one, I don't know. This is completely perplexing. This was taken um, with an Irish paranormal team. And in close up, you can see it is, in fact, uh, whilst they're gathered around during the investigation, one of the investigators is clutching a claw hammer. Quite why I've never discovered. Let's also have a, a, a short video of another piece of equipment uh, being used um, or another piece of investigation equipment being used. Here we have an example of a Victorian device. A recreation of a Victorian device known as a spirit lamp. It consists quite simply of a bulb which we can see there. We have a switch. The switch operates the bulb normally and of course we have a battery and all of the wires are exposed so that we can see clearly that there's no trickery involved. The idea being, of course, that you ask the spirit to light the lamp in response to your question. So if I just pull out a little bit and we can see my hand for scale. So spirit, can you please, if you can hear my voice, can you light the lamp for me? Thank you, spirit. What I would like to do is to set up a code, one flash for yes, and two flashes for no. Do you understand that spirit? One flash for yes and two flashes for no. Thank you spirit. Spirit, is this a real test of spirit communications? So that's a no. Spirit, is this simply a trick? Thank you, Spirit. But you know, it's not just the equipment in which diversity is demonstrated. There exists a multitude of methods derived from a host of theories, ideas, notions, and beliefs. Some might appear bizarre. Others might seem to be more credible, and some may even seem plausible. The Gansfeld, for example, is an experiment in sensory deprivation that is used by parapsychology in order to test the effects upon the mind, but it has now been pressed into service by the ghost hunters. Tell me what your name is. Who are you? Yeah, I think notable for my um, 
when I first saw the video, I never realized that Fidel Castro was um, a ghost investigator. But there we are. The cult of celebrity isn't confined to I'm a celebrity and Love Island. Investigators love to emulate their own TV heroes. And they are often seen, be seen blundering around in semi-darkness, clad in the traditional ghost fighter's uniform of a baggy black fleece and a SWAT-style fishing waistcoat. The pockets often stuffed with a, every assortment of special gadget and ghost tracking device ready to deploy on camera at a moment's notice. Meanwhile, their armies of adoring fans unquestionably, unquestioningly follow the methods and either buy every item of equipment which is product placed onto the show or set about constructing their own from parts sourced from AliExpress. The techniques and equipment used by television shows has become accepted by investigators as the de facto means for conducting their own investigations. Although many of these methods may be described as unproductive at best, often ethically unquestionable and generally worthless to psychical research. Social media has also become a rich and fertile resource for those seeking new theories to test or for confirmation of their own ideas. And those who use science are, of course, the most credible. I'm just gonna leave that slide up for a moment. If any of you um, are interested in studying or the fifth dimension. Sometimes it's also a place to find important advice, advice that you should ignore at your peril especially if during an investigation you are prone to leaving chairs empty and the air conditioning turned on. Again, I'll just give you a moment with that slide. And what about the ethics? Some paranormal investigators seem to have no bounds or limits on their desire to prove the afterlife and capture evidence to support their beliefs. Investigators have broken into locked buildings, claiming that their interest gave them every right to do so, or more recently have disregarded COVID restrictions, claiming that their nightly Facebook live stream classed them as essential workers. Whenever I meet ghost hunting groups, and I'm fortunate I meet lots of groups, it is immediately immediately apparent that there are many within the ghost hunting community who seek greater knowledge and who wish to participate in some form of additional learning. Unfortunately for them, it appears that mainstream parapsychology, instead of engaging with those who are out there investigating, have for the most part chosen instead to completely disassociate itself from the ghost hunters, except when there is a media paycheck involved and the opportunity to provide some pseudo-skeptical quote in the press. Founded in 1882, the Society for Psychical Research is considered to be the world's foremost paranormal research organization. Unfortunately for them, it's also frequently considered by those in the ghost hunting community to be the preserve of the skeptical academics who poo-poo such things as ghosts or who have, a strong, have such strong belief that they know best on how to go about the investigating of reportedly haunted houses. Over the past century and a half, members of the society have investigated countless ghosts and hauntings, and the society has a vast wealth of resources it is able to draw upon and makes available freely to anyone who wishes to avail themselves of it. Given that long history, it's interesting to look back on some of the methods that earlier generations of the ghost hunters advocated. Take, for example, this helpful method taken from the 1968 edition of the Society's Notes for Investigators of Spontaneous Cases. The notes suggested that in cases of suspected hoax or fraud, the suspect might be controlled by covering their head in a lightproof black cloth bag gathered beneath the chin so as to preclude vision but without hampering breathing and to tie their feet to the chair 
and their hands together behind their back using cotton. And of course, investigators at the famous Enfield case mentioned earlier, I thought there was nothing unusual for the adult male investigators to spend time sitting alone in the bedroom of two young girls whilst they slept. A situation that would be viewed as shockingly irresponsible today. Together with bagging and tying your um, the witnesses. Although I think waterboarding is still, I think it should still be allowed. Although the uh, 50 year old original notes for investigators still contained much useful and helpful information, it was cl quite clear that a replacement was long overdue. And in 2017, the society commissioned me to write a fully revised and updated set of guidance notes for investigators of spontaneous cases. It was intended to provide in the investigators with every level um, at every of investigators of every level with high quality guidance in key areas pertaining to the investigation of reported hauntings, poltergeists and similar phenomena. It was immediately adopted as a standard for investigators from the SPR and also from investigators um, of the Ghost Club. And in time, the publication was also added to the required leading, uh, reading list for students of the Rhine Education Centre. Now, back in 1937, Harry Price, whom we met earlier, sat down and published what can be considered as the very first set of guidance notes for investigators. These were given out to members of his investigation team that he'd recruited to assist him with the investigation at Borley Rectory. The book was printed with a blue card cover, which has resulted in it forever being referred to as the Blue Book. Almost coincidentally, in 2018, the SPR chose to use a blue card cover for their new guidance notes, which had been commissioned exactly 80 years after Price's original. Throughout 2018, I traveled to several paracons and conferences around the UK, over in Ireland, and also in the USA, promoting the society's new guidance notes. The book was very well received and gained many five-star reviews and is still available for sale. However, during the Q&A sessions, it became apparent that the majority of the questions were, relating to, were related to the equipment that the investigators were using. Which items of equipment should they use? How should they set about making measurements? And how do they interpret the results that they were obtaining? There were, of course, already many sources of information for those wishing to use equipment in the form of social media and television shows. Months ago, Aaron and Billy heard this loud bang coming from the upper part of the hangar. Oh my god. Dude. Was that upstairs? That was upstairs. The guys quickly head up there to experiment with a new piece of equipment called the Paranormal Music Box. This is a fully functional, winding music box that spirits who were alive in earlier times will be very familiar with. Spirits, especially children, will be drawn to trigger this device by using the motion sensor located on the front. Okay, walk over there, walk in front of it. And the longer you stay, the more it plays. Right. Okay, that's a good test. Now come over here. Okay, I said let's go downstairs for just a little bit. As the guys head downstairs, they receive a message on the ovulus. Poltergeist. Poltergeist! Did you just see that? Wait. What happened to our walkie-talkie when we just... Oh my god. That thing just flashed up there. The music box lights up, but there isn't enough energy to wind the device to make the music play. Is this spirit nibbling at our piece of bait? Billy decides to place the device in the exact spot where the director of security's camera was knocked over up here.
Oh. Whoa. Oh. It's just going off. It's going off. If this is the dad of the little girl and little boy and the woman that used to live here that was killed. Oh, damn it. It's the dad. This spirit intelligently confirms that he is the father of the children who the little girl spoke about and who Marty Perry also sketched earlier. That's what Marty drew. Right. It was the man that was the older man. Is that true? Is, if, if, that, if that's you, sir, can you do that again, please? Dude. Dude, that was on cue. That was on cue. Sir, can you stop? As a result of the many questions relating to equipment, which I had been asked during the launch of the initial guidance notes, in 2019, I approached the SPR with, another, with a suggestion that they should consider producing a set of guidance notes that dealt exclusively with the use of equipment and to which investigators could turn for reliable advice and helpful guidance. I estimated that it would contain around 75 pages and would be ready for publication in the spring of 2020. Then 2020 arrived. Endless months of being locked down and the joys of homeschooling. Everything got placed on hold. Well, almost everything. As each day, once the kids were secured with copious amounts of duct tape, Work on the new equipment guidance notes continued. Scrapped publication deadlines meant that I had the chance to include more information and consider a greater range of the things that investigators set out to monitor and measure. As lockdown eased and people started to emerge, it was time to prepare the new 175 page manuscript for typesetting and printing. Complementing the existing general guidance notes, which was published in 2018, this new publication represents one of the most comprehensive guides available for any investigator who uses equipment of any type to support their investigations of hauntings, apparitions, or poltergeists. It suggests the best devices to use and how to use them in the most effective way. It's not just using the equipment either. The new publication gives guidance on how to use the measurements and the data in order to maximize the potential of every item of equipment that is deployed. The 2018 set of guidance notes is now a required text for students of the Ryan Education Center and is recommended also by other course providers. And I hope that the new publication in due course will prove itself equally useful. It's available now either in print or Kindle uh, ebook edition uh, from Amazon or directly from the SPR. Also available directly from the SPR is a special reduced cost offer for those who want both sets of the guidance notes. And before ending, I should just briefly point out the uh, other two books uh, that have my name on the cover. The um, ghostology, um, also during lockdown, it was we had two lockdowns, and I took the opportunity to revise ghostology. Um, so those the earlier copies have the green cover. The new version with the blue cover um, has twenty additional pages. A revision in every single revised, heavily revised in every single chapter. And for fans of the word search, it has a brand new word search. And that's it. There you go. And I can stop screen sharing and come back to the real world. Oh, looks like uh, put the camera on. And we're back for the Q&A. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Steve. Very, uh, very interesting talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, so we'll throw the... Um, Chair, uh, the floor open to, to questions. Has <laughs> anyone got a question? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to throw uh, a, a question. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to throw 
a chair at anyone. Um, has anyone got any questions? If you have, wasn't like that in Glasgow. Type them into the chat, or uh, you can raise your hand. Any questions at all? I'll go with one. Um, Steve, you mentioned hmm. um, the SPR case from the eighteen eighty rhythm. Eighteen ninety eight uh, nine. The, yeah, the alleged haunting of Bee House. Mm -hmm. um, I think most people will probably know that Bee House is actually Belekin House. Ha right. Have you ever been to Belekin House? No, because it's not there. Have you ever been looking for it? I have been looking for it and it's not there. Um, it, it was demolished. Um, there is a building, um, although we went and we were told it was demolished and uh, we, we went and we had a look and we found a building on the site that we believe may be B house rebuilt. Um, I defer to you here because we were told it was demolished. I've always repeated that it's not the original building, but it looks like an old building and it's on the same site. So is it the same one? As far as I'm aware, it is, as you say, on the same site and everything. There is one section of it which was the original building. Mm. Um, it's part of the, what was the servants' quarters. Mm -hmm. There's a, basically a room or, or at least three walls, if not an entire room, that still exists. Mm. And um, that is incorporated into the house. The house was actually for sale oh, a few years ago now. And I really thought they missed a trick. Um, because they were advertising it at something like £640,000, and I really thought they should have gone for £666,000. Well, I thought that was the price for Beleskin. Well, that's um, been rebuilt. Beleskin um, is... Uh, Sim similar sounding, but not the same building. <laughs> yeah, currently in very, very poor state. I don't know when the last time you were there, but... Um, they are currently selling off burnt bits of wood <laughs> from that house to to uh, fund the uh, the restoration project. So um, yeah, it burnt down and then they bought it mm. to redo. And when it got out that they were going to make a sort of museum to to Crowley and to to magic and things of, of that nature, it. Um, it got set fire to again. Mm. I, I was incredibly fortunate. I was on a Loch Ness monster uh, hunting trip uh, by day, and of course, ghosts by night. And the churchyard directly opposite Boleskin has um, some interesting ghost stories. But whilst we were there, um, we were um, we had the opportunity to meet the owner of Boleskin, who cordially invited us inside, and we were given. Um, a half hour tour of the building well he went to the kitchen we were allowed to wander around for half an hour and give him tea and then we went back to our um, perambulations of the graveyard so um, yeah just I think it was a year or two before it before it burnt down so I was incredibly fortunate but I can see yeah uh, there's a couple of questions in, in in the chat on the side I can see Yep, so the first one is from, from Stu Smith, who's hosting this talk. So thank you, as always, for that, Stu. Um, he was looking at the, uh, <laughs> at, the, at the spider, and Stu, being the, the, the consummate geek that he is, mm -hmm. um, thought he spotted a ZX Spectrum in there. He did. He, he did. In yeah. one of the, the earlier incarnations, um, the, the, the computer... Uh, was changed several times. Spider is not a single item. Um, so it went through set a number of iterations and a number of computers. There was a BBC Model B at one point and an Acorn at another. Um, it still exists. Most of um, the Spider setup still exists. I am aware of where it is. And immediately prior to um, lockdown, uh, I was actively working on a plan to take Spider um, on holiday here to West Wales for a period of time and then put it alongside its modern counterparts or equivalents uh, to test, to give us an opportunity to look at the, the sensors, what they were, um, you know, the range that the sensors were operating in. Um, and 
I suppose also, also an homage to Cornell and Gould for creating the device. Um, so I'm still hopeful of that plan um, will come to fruition. Um, and of course, for Stu, we can get we can get ZX81 emulators now as well. <laughs> Oh, it's a Spectrum, though. It was a Spectrum, not oh, a yeah. ZX81. Spectrum. Oh, it's a ZX-Spec. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I can see another one below it about uh, another pet uh, item of equipment, another famous yeah. item of equipment. So that uh, that second question you're referring to there is from Marker, and that's, hi, Steve. What do you think of the SLS camera? I can't remember. I always get this modelled up. It stands for, uh, no, I can't remember what it is now. But basically, um, what this is, is a Connect 360 head from an Xbox. Uh, it's the, the camera console from an Xbox gaming system that's been adapted and modified so that it works with, uh, originally it worked with a PC. Later, they've uh, got Android and tablet versions of it. Um, and there are now many commercial versions of the SLS system, all using the basic Xbox um, camera system. Um, it was first deployed on uh, Ghost Adventures with Zach Bagans, and um, the the camera um, has even on the show it's gone through a number of incarnations. Uh, in two thousand and nineteen. During my trip, during a trip to America, um, I was fortunate enough to be able to uh, borrow, uh, or I was given for the night, the actual ca SLS camera um, that's used on the television show, the one that's used by Zach and the others on on Ghost Adventures, and we used it to demonstrate to um, participants how the camera actually worked because the SLS camera system utilizes the connect camera which i've said now the connect camera is designed for game players so that they can interact with their console and they do it by a series of movements and uh, motion it's a, so it has a number of um it has an infrared uh, component to it. it has a normal um low resolution camera system as part of it as part of it what it does and the software inside the, the system is really very basic. It's designed to look for uh, a player, a person, um, and detect motion in that person, and then turns that screen motion. Um, you, when you look at the uh, output from the camera, it creates these little stick men, indicating where, it, where the system believes that there is uh, an individual or a player, game player. What people started to notice, um, which led to the development of the SLS, is that occasionally the camera would detect things that weren't there um, and indicate an additional player or an additional person in the room. And people started to say, oh, the camera is detecting ghosts. Once that, once word of that got out in the press that the camera could detect ghosts, the ghost hunters <laughs> um, went for it big time. In fact, we're having a similar situation now with Teslas, the Tesla car with its autopilot system. Um, there are quite a number, a growing number of videos appearing on YouTube now of people driving into uh, cemeteries in America in their Teslas and um, parking up um, or cruising slowly around, waiting for ghosts to be alerted on the uh, pedestrian uh, detection alert system which is based on the connect camera um very very similar technology and also indicates in, a, in exactly the same way by putting little stick men on on its um, monitor screen uh, the idea being of course that the tesla car won't then run them over um now the camera system itself is very crude the software i should say is, is actually very crude and it's programmed to look for a human figure. And the human figure in its software is basically an upright, which is the person, uh, a cross um, bar at the top, which would represent the shoulders or arms, and what's called a terminator, which the system recognizes as a head. 
and it's 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 very easy if you've got one of these devices it's very easy using the corner of a door frame um or some other similar t or cross-shaped confluence of lines or you know the edge of a filing cabinet and often work as well or the edge of a, an item of furniture um, and you can create these little stick men because whenever the software sees these um, objects these these um, points within its software it draws a stick man and uh, well, the rest of it's down to history really now what was most interesting is we were showing participants and having them use zach's camera uh, during the investigation of course they were all very excited none of them washed their hands afterwards um you know this was pre-covid um and we thought that we had perhaps poked a hole um burst the bubble of the myth of the the sls camera system uh, until we were having a break and we overheard a couple of them talking to one another saying it was all very interesting but i still think it's paranormal so kind of reminded me of an event that happened at mary king's close with it during a time when we were doing so you want to be a ghost hunter up there as part of the ghost fest and um we'd we'd explained how equipment can be fooled and how people can be tricked by the equipment and then we went we took the group down into mary king's close and after about 10 minutes a couple came excitedly up from um, near chesney's house and said that they were being uh, that they were communicating with the spirit of annie by using the red light on the video camera and we should come see and of course we went to see this was exciting stuff and we got down there and they were calling out to annie and saying look look at the camera it's she's responding and on the back of the the video camera on its tripod indeed a small red light was periodically intermittently flickering and flashing it was a hard drive access light on the camcorder showing that the camera was operating normally but it it's interesting how it doesn't really matter what you show and tell people their belief is a, is a powerful motivator and so the sls camera will always be a fantastic device albeit it's it's just a software trick the software doing what it was programmed to do cool thank you for that steve and thank you for asking that marker uh next comment is from ewan irving some people will, will hello know. ewan <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> there we are uh ewan's a stalwart of the arthur Conan doyle uh, structured society, light sensor who've got a lot of uh different talks and things happening all of the time so have a look at them and see what they what they're doing there's loads of things you can access with them so ewan says I came across a few books from 1936 after the Raynham Hall ghost sighting, where a newspaper invited readers from up and down the country to recite stories they had heard or witnessed. They received thousands of letters. Many were ordinary stories and recounted word for word. Well before the days of ghost hunting groups, but it was the stories related from clergy, lawyers, ordinary men and women up and down the land. Many had witnesses to what had happened, which for me is perhaps the best proof. Well, it, as it says in um, in the opening um, of the new equipment guidance notes, all of the evidence to date for the existence of these phenomena, apparitions, um, poltergeist, um, apparitions and hauntings, comes from um, a human te a human witness. There isn't yet a piece of equipment that is captured one of these anomalies you know irrefutably we've got thousands of ghost photographs and we've got thousands millions you know there are groups going out on a saturday night and getting more evidence um you know in in three hours on a saturday night on their facebook live than the spr or indeed the entirety of psychical research has managed in 150 plus years um I would I would just like to pull up the there were in fact ghost hunting groups back in the 1930s. Um, there were several in existence um, around the dotted around the country, psychical research groups in different forms, 
and of, and of course you have the SPR and you have the Ghost Club both in existence. But there were a number of regional um, groups. Um, indeed, some of them uh, visited uh, Borley Rectory, others uh, went off um, and critically examined several cases up in up and around Bol the Bolton area um, in, in the north of England. So there were groups as well. But the proof comes, or the evidence comes from human testimony. Um, it, the equipment is there to measure um, the environment, to help the investigators test the veracity of some of the claims, to objectify some of the claims. The room went colder. We could measure the temperature. I heard a sound. Well, we could record sound. So it's there to, to give the investigators uh, an opportunity to perhaps review uh, the person's experience or to or to test the, the experience. But I would agree entirely. It's, it's human testimony is the best evidence that we have. We've got a, a quick comment from Greg Hardman, who has uh, solved Hello, the Greg. problem of what SLS stands for. Mm. It's Structured Light Sensor. And Scott Watson has said basically pareidolia by digital eye. Graham Taylor. Has, Electronic snake oil, I call it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Graham Taylor has weighed in on the Sinclair. Agreed, read the Sinclair Spectrum, also a very old cassette recorder. Steve, you stated hmm. at the start of your talk that when you began your investigations nearly half a century ago, and more than half there, a century, are really old, um, <laughs> uh, you were determined to use the scientific method as much as possible. Has that approach ever led you to identify any level of repeatable or fundamental pattern from the various pieces of test equipment that investigators have been using? Oh, what an excellent question. Um, the short answer is no. But the long, the long answer is that I have, be, I have grown increasingly um, more interested in some types of phenomena. Perhaps um, I'm, I'm not, in the last few years, I have really pushed for investigators to start once again looking at and examining, monitoring, observing, measuring the temperature, because there are within the within the literature um there are a number of accounts of well recorded um anomalous temperature changes both up and mostly down but there have been some ups as well um that are coincident with people also reporting um an anomalous experience it is the only variable which we know that we have this uh, a non physical anomaly coincident with or concurrent with um, a subjective experience, reported experience. Um, it doesn't exist with any other anomaly, but sadly temperature down the years has become sidelined by, it's not cool, it doesn't say the word poltergeist, for example. You know, we haven't got thermometers that scream dude run or play, you know, and we haven't yet got a steampunk gothic designed one, um, you know, to use on, on, on television or, or your YouTube channel. But equipment is, is nevertheless important. And so is the scientific method um, because it allows us to at least be certain that when we consider something, it's been properly reviewed properly considered properly measured and it also prevents us from blundering into that area that you you know that i illustrated uh, in the presentation of just trying to explain something in order to sound clever you know a, a good investigator really should know when to stop when to shut up and simply throw their arms up in horror and go you know what we just don't know we can't explain this one but we you know you can only reach that point when you can be sure that you've examined all of the possibilities that you or others can consider. So peer review is very important. But what you do see with, um, with uh, some academics is that they will always be able to explain something, you know, that they are never 
they will never say we don't know. They might say, oh, that's interesting, but it could be a supersonic fly. Cool. So one piece of equipment you would advocate that people take on a ghost investigation is a thermometer to record the temperature. I, I think it's essential. Um, I was asked to put together um, a small um, w grab bag for each of the, uh, the new field research group investigators, um, the SPR's teams, team. And this, what we decided upon in the end after consultation was a fairly basic video camera. Um, it didn't have night vision capabilities. It was just an off the shelf, fairly cheap. It did have the advantage of having uh, one of these selfie cam uh, things built into the uh, LCD screen so it could look forwards and in any other direction so you could we could at least set it up on a tripod look in one direction but also demonstrate there was nobody lurking you know behind the camera um, we also gave them a still camera a fairly basic 12 megapixel um, you know compact little point and shoot camera uh, they were issued also with sound recorders um, a zoom h1 in order to conduct interviews and if an opportunity to record a sound arose um, and one of the most expensive items we provided them with was a thermal hygrometer thermal hygrometer which gave them the opportunity to uh, measure and document the temperature and the humidity um, and i included that because of my belief that temperature um, may be so far the only anomaly that there is some serious questions that remain unanswered and these questions were posed back in the 1930s in the 1940s and continue to you know the present day temperature seems to do some strange things sometimes it's not very common but then it may just be not very common now because nobody takes thermometers with them on investigations anymore or at least if they do they're not measuring the temperature uh in in a meaningful way you know the Mel meter, for example, has got a thermometer built into it. Um, but these things are only pulled out when somebody says, oh, I feel really cold. Oh, yeah. Oh, look, you're 20 degrees colder than the rest of the room. But you've got no baseline to work against because nobody's been measuring it. So that was the kit, you know, um, video camera, camera, um, sound recorder, thermometer. Uh, Greg's asking about the, I assume, the thermometer is that a data coder thermometer or or some other form of thermometer um they they have the ability to record the measurements um from 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 the device um we also have data loggers but the team member is only allocate is it the, the one that we've chosen is there is no need to measure temperature every 10 seconds or 10 times a second you know the the instructions uh, within the guidance notes you know we say that we suggest that as a baseline you only really need to measure the temperature once every five or ten minutes um because it's not going to vary by very much very often and if it does suddenly start to change then of course you can you can increase the rate at which you're observing the display or making you know the best way to note stuff down and record stuff is still that and a and a pad so Mark is asking as a, a direct uh, comment on that. So a thermometer and a, a mobile phone, will that do? I no. personally never, never bring any kit other than a mobile. Well, actually, I would, um, I've done a number of talks and, and, and included in Ghostology and indeed the new equipment guidance notes is a section strongly advocating that the mobile phone might be the, a godsend to paranormal investigators um, because it has if, if we look at the, the for example, the, the current iPhones, the 12 and the 13, although, you know, let, let's, let's even go back to the iPhone 10. They've got 4K video. They've got low light video on most of them. They've got a bloody good camera, an excellent sound recorder that is the equal of a Zoom H1, H2, H4, um, providing you, you spend a few quid on a little plug, you know, plug in microphone for it. Um, it's got a barometer. It's got motion sensors, it's got accelerometers, it's got light sensors. And unfortunately, ghost hunters tend to use their mobile phone 
by using a ghost hunting app such as m2 or ghost radar a lot of these are just software trickery um but there are there are apps and software available that allow you to interrogate the raw sensor data uh, from the magnetometer for example um and from the barometer from from even for the from the camera itself and there are you know specialist software the 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 iPhone is uh, currently being used by the United States Geological Service, the USGS, amongst others, uh, to replace the expensive seismometer um, monitoring stations, um, which they'd set up all around um, the, the, these fault zones that they have so many of in America. And indeed, there's one up near um, B House. <laughs> yeah. There's also plenty along the Great Glen as well, if I remember rightly. Um, but what they discovered is instead of spending tens of thousands of dollars on a, a data telemetry um, seismometer system, um, they, they created a solid cradle for an iPhone, uh, stuck the thing down, and of course, it just texted in every few hours the data from its own accelerometers, um, saved them a fortune. So, yet yeah, used correctly, uh, that device in your pocket could well save you from carrying a whole raft of um, pieces of equipment. But, you know, there have to be caveats. The thing is connected to, you know, uh, Wi-Fi, to the global um, phone network, to other, other systems, to Bluetooth. And so you have to you know, turn things on and off. You can't just plug something in and use something because it could damage the measurements. Um, but that's all covered actually in the equipment notes and ghostologies. Um, as indeed is the Tesla car, if anybody's got one, wants to use it on a ghost hunt. Drive around Mary King's close in the Tesla. Has it been done yet? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm betting not. <laughs> Talking of uh, software trickery and jiggery porkery there, um, Stu Smith has said that when computer vision is based on opaque machine learning pattern matching algorithms, then seeing things that aren't really there is somewhat inev inevitable, especially if it's used out of context. Mm -hmm. Maybe that shows it's closer to the human mind than we'd like to think. <laughs> that speaks a nerd. <laughs> You've met Stu. <laughs> <laughs> Moving rapidly on, um, we've got another question from Graham. Uh, do any ghost hunters ever use in their field investigations sensitive sash velocity style anemometers to prove or disprove the existence of supernatural drafts and gusts of wind? Since the question needs to be answered, is a sudden chill being caused by thermal transfer or some other form of non-conventional energy loss? The short answer is read the equipment guidance notes, because there's a whole section in air movement um, that discusses hot wire anemometers and, and, and other, you know, and why they're useful. Um, and I think there is even, uh, do you know, what? must be the time of evening, but the, oh, what was it called? um electron flow cooling as well that can ion cooling that can sometimes it's used in computers now but that could also be affected some locations caused by high static electric fields um so no they don't well to answer the question no they don't uh, but they should and um in my parascience investigation kit which is behind me um there is indeed a hot wire a data recording hot wire an anemometer and an air vane, um, a turbine anemometer, because um, recording the outside uh, weather can, prevailing weather conditions is also important and can impact the conditions inside of a building. You know, if it's blowing a hoolie outside, it's probably going to be quite drafty inside. And uh, many of these breezes are often labeled as psychic breezes. And many of these weird cooling effects um, can be determined by uh, by sensitive uh, motion measuring, but they can also be detected now by using thermal imagery, uh, radiometric photography. 
Okay, cool. Thank you for that, Steve. Which is also covered in the equipment guidance. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything that's not in the equipment guide? <laughs> mm. Actually, there is, but I'm not going to say it because I don't want to admit to having an omission. Um, it was oh. when it was published, I went, oh, I forgot that thing. But it was a relatively obscure piece of equipment that, um, as I said, lockdown was, I'd said, oh, well, I think it'd be about 70 pages or thereabouts. And then it came to, well, I'll just add this and I'll just include that. And I'll just put in a chapter about. Yeah, I mean, it's it's that terrible thing of once the book's published, you always spot mistakes or typos or things that you should have oh, put in or, or something. That was, the, that, was, that was the nightmare with Paracoustics. Uh, we sent it to uh, the publisher who gave it to a proofreader. And one of the things with proofreaders is we all write it in, in a particular style um, and you have a way of putting words together. And the proofreader had a different style of writing than myself and Dr. Uh, Cal Cooper and made large corrections to the text, um, including to some scientific formula, which were importantly, you know, the way we'd put them down, um, which led to a frantic phase of cutting and pasting back the original text um, and some, some errors that got then into print so much so that we had to print um you know for for pe purchase people who purchased the book the early editions and there was a page you could download free um on a facebook page and then paste it in um <laughs> but that was all down to a proofreader so i've always sent it out now to um, at least 10 people you know sent the manuscript out and said look go through it and and even then you'll get 10 different responses back you know mo people start moving commas and semicolons around because we all sort of read and write differently and how we read the text might be different and so you you start this sort of well where does the comma actually go <laughs> And then you've got the whole horrible argument of the Oxford comma and whether you should use mm. that or not. But mm. let's not go there. Let's rapidly go to Colin D's sensible question instead. Steve, would you typically start an investigation by setting up the equipment and observing monitors, etc., from another room? Or do you engage in the typical verbal communication? Example, if there is anybody with us tonight, please move an object or wrap on the table. Neither. I would basically start any investigation by speaking to the witness and listening to their testimony and their accounts. Uh, based upon that, I may deploy equipment. Now, that equipment, you, there is no point in taking every item of equipment, you know, turning up with your um, SUV with the blacked out windows and your group name on the on the side of it and, you know, spending four hours deploying tons and tons of equipment and cap trying to capture everything you will just simply drown yourself in data um, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of video and audio recordings and in all likelihood either fall asleep or miss entirely anything that happened so it's it's all led by the account so there is you know if 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 the phenomena that's been reported was a sound then of course it would be sensible to deploy sound recording equipment um, and plus video recording equipment to cover the obvious, like, was there anybody else in the room when you heard the footsteps? Um, but ordinarily, the equipment should be used in a, in a highly targeted way uh, to deal with the specific events that the witness has reported. Now, I know that there are a lot of groups nowadays go what I call speculative ghost hunting. They go to a building simply because it looks old or because it looks a bit spooky or because it was an asylum um, or a former school building or a former, well, any building they want, really. If you've got to feed you, uh, you've got to feed the Facebook live feed every night. Um, now, speculative ghost hunting is, I think, po pretty pointless because you are going to capture you. Every time you deploy equipment, you will capture an anomaly because anomalies are part of kind of their hard baked into the equipment. I'll give you for, uh, for, uh, for instance, if you go on your holidays to the fantastic city of Edinburgh, where I'll be at Halloween, um, and you take hundreds of pictures on your 
phone or mobile uh, mobile phone or, or or if you still have one a digital camera um, and you go home you put them on your computer screen and you you admire your photographic talents and memories but if you're a ghost hunter and you go to these places ghost hunters tend to look at their photographs blown up to 800 percent or more and go scrutinize every single pixel and I don't know of very many digital photographs that don't have the odd blown or dodgy pixel caused by the software writing the image from the sensor. Um, but they make big, big play of this. And it's the same with digital audio. It's the same with, um, you know, all of the recording techniques that we use. Anomalies will, e will, will often exist, but the anomaly itself without, you know, it, this idea of using full spectrum photography is another, you know, the person saw a phantom, an apparition, walk across the room. You're going there with an infrared camera and looking in the infrared spectrum for proof of the paranormal. You will see lots of anomalies because you're not used to looking at the world through the through an infrared scope. But the person didn't have infrared vision. What they saw was in the visible spectrum. So you start from that, you know, you start with the known and work towards the unknown. You know that they saw something, it was in the visible spectrum. There is no point in deploying a full spectrum or infrared, I mean, no point in deploying a full spectrum camera anyway, they don't exist. Um, except for very, very specialist scientific applications that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and of course, that's explained in ghostology, why there is no such thing as a full spectrum camera. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. Some good points there, Steve. Um, we've got another comment, another question from Scott Watson, long term member of the Ghost Club. Do you have a list of your preferred items for people to run their own experiments with? Uh, well, um, I don't think that we need to run experiments. You know, this idea of going along to conduct an experiment. The investigator isn't there to conduct experiments. Um, what you're there to do is you're more like a forensic detective. You know, somebody, an event took place. You weren't there when the event took place. You have the witness's account. Can you test the veracity of that account? Um, so can you replicate it? can you be there at the same you know the same time of day that it took place once you have some idea of you know you might theorize then as to what transpired then you can start developing a hypothesis and testing it by experimentation but you wouldn't ordinarily just go to an investigator right tonight we're going to try a table tipping experiment or we're going to try a communication experiment because what you're 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 straying away from the investigation process you're in fact creating your own set of anomalies your own set of paranormal phenomena that the witness doesn't know anything about it was, you know it's not connected to why you're there so uh experiments come way 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 down the process uh much 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 later on once you've looked at the evidence considered the evidence developed a hypothesis uh, to try and test and then gone out and it and then you know use experimentation cool thank you for that steve um mark has been impressed by some of the the geeking out that people have been doing this <laughs> evening so he's trying to to out geek everyone going to set geek level to 10 myself mm. and a couple of friends are considering using a big data style solution using aws as long as it's not too expensive is there any form of solution using the data collected being placed into a, a big data solution? We really don't know where to start, but initial thoughts would be to place evidence from different sources and use that to provide decent reporting. Do you have any thoughts? Um, well, I suppose the closest that we could get to that at the moment is the Spontaneous Cases Committee of the SPR and the fact that they collect accounts. Um, but there is some controversy even amongst the SCC as to you know how you know whether it's worth collecting these sort of huge chunks of data, um, you know, and how would we go about doing it? You know, there have been discussions of 
um well we just buy um a subscription to fake magazine um you know and it happened to me because it's as meaningful as people writing in saying i saw a ghost last week or i saw a ghost 10 years ago um, and a lot of those experiences uh they the way that they're presented by the witness by the experiencer um, is really not helpful you know they they are um i thought i would write and tell somebody about um about my experience that happened 15 years ago we were on holiday in norfolk and my husband said and, and you can't go back you can't review that 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 experience you can simply take the account and put it to one side now there are um psychical researchers who have looked at this raw data to see if they could i think john fraser had done, had done some work in this area um but it's 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 just too scattergun um and we you know we've tried to use this enormous pool um, of data from people's experiences and people's accounts and stories and we've tried you know we've even tried using fake magazine and, and other and other sources and 14 times you know the it happened to me little box outs on the side um but ultimately we don't we haven't found a system or a method that allows us to use that data in any constructive way so if geek level 10 can sort it sort it out uh, we'd be extremely happy because you know people have looked at this as a as a source now that's not to say that historical data isn't important and it's something i advocate when you know as part of the investigation process that you you should draw upon every available resource and that may be other groups going before you to that location because it you know look at the similarities of experience look at the locations where those experiences are reported the experiences themselves might be flimsy you know our medium sensed that but if those sensations were all common to one location and if you can rule out the fact that they've all sat and read each other's facebook pages and commented on one another's facebook pages then you can start to perhaps see patterns emerging that particular areas locations within or zones within a location might be more interesting for you to consider and to look at or to deploy something you know to monitor cool i think you've touched on the next question um from greg as well in part of your answer there steve what do you think of investigating historic cases in locations for example a lady in black seen in a manor house corridor some 80 years ago um honestly i don't i wouldn't because i don't think i realistically could um if the lady in black in a corridor 80 years ago was in a location where people today are having experiences the, the experiences may be dissimilar but you would still make note of that earlier event that took place at that location um as part of that looking for patterns and trends but i wouldn't go back and say oh look you know somebody saw an apparition here 80 years ago people see apparitions all of the time um and they they can't be feasibly investigated you can't get anything meaningful from from these type of one-offs uh, oddities that happen incredibly often you know I, i'm sure there is probably not a person sitting watching this presentation and um and subsequent playbacks that, that can't think back to a weird thing that happened to them you know years and years and years ago when when myself and Anne Winsper um started out with parascience oh, it was 30 something years ago now um we used to do you know periodic talks um to local groups like the campers club and the dog grooming society and the, the naturists um and we we would always start off with and it was always around halloween and we'd always start off with the um with a question has anybody here seen the ghost and there'd be a nervous shuffling and sort of 
sideways glances at one another and everybody you know hands were sort of hard hard shoved into into pockets and we gave the talk and then at the end people lingered back and they would tell us a ghost story but we're in the situation now because of the media because of the television uh, um the frequency at which ghosts um ghosts are shown on television you know if you ask that question today at the start of a meet uh that the start you'd never get the presentation done because everybody would have their ghost story because it's much more socially acceptable now to share your weird experiences but they're incredibly common and to try and you know where i live in west wales and where greg lives so he knows the answer to this question anyway um you know i don't know of a single castle or old building that doesn't have a ghost story attached to it and they're just unfeasible you can't go and investigate them you you could if you had a facebook live channel <laughs> and there are groups out here in west wales and throughout the united kingdom yay even even north of the border in scotland um that spend their lives going night after night five six seven days a week on the facebook to any building wherein has ever been reported some weird experience so greg no i wouldn't fairly straightforward answer there uh we do have a, a comment that i didn't read out earlier on at the end of marker's uh comment if anyone wants to give me a tesla i'm happy to drive it into <laughs> king's course or anywhere okay so uh, uh usual plea there if we have any eccentric millionaires watching this uh, I'll, I'll take one round the covenanters <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to get a fairly tight bend into through. the gate so isn't it as you go past mackenzie and <laughs> it's it's always locked at the moment the covenant is it yeah yeah oh. um there was a there was a bit of a, a break-in incident shall we oh. say um at uh, bloody mackenzie's tomb and um yeah it's the, the covenant's prison is locked oh that's such a that's it. such a loss because um years ago i, I knew jan um yeah. who, who who ran who had the keys to, and he was gracious enough um on on a couple of nights when there was no um tours booked to give us the keys and you know lock yourself, let yourselves out and lock up afterwards and one of the things that we very quickly discovered on our first visit to the covenanters we went back to, to Jan the next day and said, uh, Mackenzie's tomb, uh, you know, inside the Covenanters where the poltergeist is, it's not the one where the events took place, is it? How did you know that? So, well, we figured it out from, from the descriptions and the location itself. So why do you use a different tomb? And why are things happening in the other tomb now anyway? He said, we used a different tomb for health and safety reasons, because the floor in the original was too unstable. Uh, it was too rough and people, you know, would trip over things. So we had to move the tours further down and seemingly the poltergeist followed them, <laughs> <laughs> which was lucky. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you know, then, then were the days when you, you know, you could get the keys for the Covenanters and, you know, Jan himself was a, you know, a legend um, down at the Tron yeah um, yeah I mean, it's, it's only when you're going on a guided tour on a ghost tour or for special events that you can get into the covenants now mm. but i i know when i first moved up to edinburgh um the covenant was just just open it was mm. just part of greyfriars kirkyard that you could mm. just go into no problem at all things have changed you know, sadly like, well i i think that's a problem with having you know so so much so many groups um because you know some of them are not currently very you know ethical in the in the in the way that they're operating because they're feeding that you know uh, there are groups now who claim to make a living from um these facebook lives and that's fine you know they've created a niche in the market but you know they have got themselves into hot water on a number of occasions uh accessing places that they shouldn't be um you know we lost a location here in west wales for similar reasons because a group of ghost hunters smack smashed their way into a part of a building that they weren't that they've been told not to go to and you know there are a lot of locations now that are wary of groups coming along because they tend to you know um swansea museum i was there uh, uh two weeks ago visiting with the boys during the day and we were talking it used to be um 
you know, a leading venue for Saturday night ghost hunts. And I said, any plans to um, start up again after after lockdown? Oh, we've stopped doing them three or four years ago. So why was that? Because they would go into areas where, you know, that were clearly marked private, where the doors were locked. In one occasion, they they um, came into the office, took the keys, went back out and unlocked this other part of the building. And this just spoils it. And that's, you know, you see the effects at, at Mary King's Close genuine or interested researchers are now tarred with the same brush which is a great shame definitely definitely agree with you there and on that downer note <laughs> right, um oh oh no there's a comment here from scott watson i'm always amazed at how many youtubes have so many experiences on their channels some have more per episode than some people experience yeah. in their whole life. as i said before you know one one facebook live can produce more definitive proof for the existence of ghosts and 150 years of the existence of the s 140 years next year of the existence of the spr has managed um you know and yeah, you know, you talk to these mediums that, that you know, the, and the groups themselves, and you know, they are absolutely convinced and they're unshakable in these beliefs, uh, which has led to uh, they also don't tend to read um, very much. Um, you know, when when I started, the only source of material for my burgeoning interest uh, were books by Price and Andrew Green, and Hubert Thurston, and Maurice Gross, and you know, they. You, you could see the methods and you could see what was right and what was proper. But now, you know, it, it's, they live in a, a, a different world to my, to me, you know, I, I'm not one, a child of the digital generation. Unfortunately, all of the early mistakes that I made in paranormal investigation um, are long buried <laughs> and don't exist on, on YouTube to come back and haunt me. Um, but it's, it's, you know, uh, the SPR, we were, we were talking about the new guidance notes and trying to reach the people who need them most, you know, the, the ghost hunting community. We need to outreach out to these, to these community, to this group of individuals and try to offer them uh, a resource. And so in addition to the guidance notes, um, hopefully later this year, perhaps early next uh, the SPR will be producing a set, a series of um, what are called quick guides. And these will be, um, the information will be drawn from the guidance notes, but it'll be in a much more condensed form. So you, it'll be one sheet, one side, perhaps two sides of, um, as a PDF. Um, now, it won't contain the information of the guidance notes, but it will contain bullet points of good practice that, you know, pertaining to, every item of equipment that, you know, so if they want to, you know, look, look at the way to set up the thermometer, they can just print this, download it, print it out and shove it into their pocket or the kit bag. Um, and we're going to expand beyond that to video guides, which are two and three minutes long, each dealing with, with, with um, the subject material in little bite-sized bits that people can download from the YouTube channel or link to the SPR's YouTube channel and share amongst their mates and hopefully we'll you know spread this idea of uh the spr being a resource that sounds like an excellent thing to that's have not a replacement to buy the guidance now so because oh, of course you know, not i mean no, obviously because, you do need the full background and of course the the quick guides and the video guides will link back to um yeah the shop page yeah the shop page <laughs> <laughs> excellent We've got a couple of or three quick comments, I think, and then we'll call it a day because we've we've taken up quite a lot of your time, for which we're Zach all very Bagans very. Zach Bagans has a book. <laughs> Sorry, Zach Bagans has a book. Zach Bagans see. has a book indeed. Yeah, and I was um, I was asked by the SPR to review that book. Oh dear, yeah, and I got into trouble with uh, a skeptical researcher in America by the name of Sharon Hill, oh, because yeah. I because yeah. I I gave it a good review. Or she thought I'd given it a good review. And in fact, what I'd said is it's inevitable that this book will sell and it will sell in large numbers. And having read the book because he never wrote it, as it was revealed, um, the contents in, of the book themselves will do you no harm. They will not mislead you um, and they are generally 
you know, beneficial or supportive of good practice. So if you're going to buy the book, read the bloody thing. I'm, <laughs> Don't I'm just not, shove it on your shelf. I'm and not, she took that as a positive review because I was telling, she thought of something to buy it, but I said, no, we've got to recognize that people are going to buy this book. It's going to sell, mm, you know, yes. you've got to pay that advance back. He's, he's got a name. So people are going to buy mm. it. Definitely. Uh, Greg comments that locations develop more ghost stories than they ever historically had before ghost hunting groups go in. I think oh, yes, there's a, there's a, there's a, Greg well knows when I first moved to Pembrokeshire uh, 14 years ago, um, Pembroke Castle had two ghosts. Um, and this was in the days when ghost hunters didn't go to Pembroke Castle. It just had two quiet, two ghosts that quietly got on with whatever ghosts quietly get on with doing. They, they bothered nobody, but they were documented and had been documented for about 50 years. Um, you know, going back through the different gazetteers and the, the press cuttings, these, these two ghosts had periodically been reported. Uh, the current situation, speaking to the ghost finder general at Pembroke Castle, uh, who's a very nice man. Uh, he'd come down here a few years ago from uh, Salisbury Hall which has its own ghost and he did the ghost tours up there and he's developed that sort of same ghost tourism down here. Pembroke Castle now has at least 30 ghosts um, that himself and various um, paranormal groups who visited and overnighted at the castle um, have managed to um, tease out. Interesting case. Um, Graham's got... Um... A, a contrary view, shall we say. I like there contrary There may also be a similar, similar situation at play with regards to excessive ghost investigation teams. Might they actually put the ghosts off their stride in the same way that conventional archaeologists have no great love for metal detectorists wrecking their unexplored pictures? I, I, I recognise that there is a, a rift between, well, I'm an old-style investigator. I've been doing it for forever. And this new generation of uh, pop-up ghost hunters um, and this sort of conflict of you've spoiled it for us. We used to get along and we, we would spend next to nothing getting in. And now they're asking a thousand pounds. But what is what's interesting from my point, uh, point of view, apart from the fact that they've ruined it, you know, I can't go anywhere now without paying a fortune to be there. You don't even, you, know, you used to get a bowl of cornflakes at some of these locations in the morning. Now you just slung out. <laughs> um, they take your money and you're thrown back out again. Um, is that if we, if we strip it all down to, let, let's assume that most people have got, if they're going out on a public ghost hunt, um, the teams will have some equipment. They themselves will have, some equipment they may have a camera or a video camera they've certainly got the smartphones with them um, which which do give them um, abilities to record sound vision and uh, still pictures yet we're not seeing the convincing evidence that perhaps we ought um, you know we don't have you've got perhaps tens of thousands of man hours expended annually in haunted locations they're in the right place supposedly at the right time supposedly but they're not producing the evidence now the investigators themselves will claim that they are but when you actually look at the evidence critically there's nothing there um, it's an anomaly within the recording it's it's in it a trick of the camera a trick of the light or a misperception by the individual or somebody just wanting to rush to the red tops, you know, with the, oh, we got a ghost. And that worries me a little because it could be that the ghosts are just not getting their fair whack. You know, there might be a ghost version of equity and they're just not playing for the cameras anymore because, you know, why should they? They're not getting a share of the cut um, from the, you know, the proceeds of the investigation that's going on. The public are paying, people are taking a profit. The ghosts aren't getting a share of it. I remember on a television program I did, um, the famous and frightened series, we were all down at Dover Castle and um, the commissioning editor for um, uh, living television, living TV at the time, who now the boss of Sky, um, stood up and proposed a, a vote of thanks to everybody present. 
um, and he he said, uh, and then one of the celebrity contestants on I'm Famous and Frightened, and these were true, you know, these were proper A-listers, um, none of this um, friend of a friend of a, who's once been on a reality TV show, um, stood up and said, don't forget to thank the dead people. <laughs> <laughs> said yeah but we don't have to pay them they get the biggest thanks of all and that might be part of the problem or it might just be that this lack of evidence prove uh, is, is illustrative that there is a lack of phenomena you know the may we may just be dealing with uh psychophysiological effects caused by the environment uh, combined with misperception and a huge sprinkling of priming the pump of belief and expectation. We just don't know, but that's no reason to stop looking. What an excellent comment to end everything on. If you don't look, you'll never find out. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Thank you very much for an entertaining evening. Very entertaining I've enjoyed it. Talk and a very By the book. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for some excellent reads from all the books that you've written, including the one that I've not read yet, but I'm sure it is just as good. So, Steve, on behalf of everyone here tonight and everyone watching on YouTube, thank you very much. It's thank been you for having me once again. <laughs>